All right. We're good. We got slides. All right. Hello. I'm Mike Wolf. I'm here to present today the um, uh, state of the server group. So many of you probably don't know me. I work for IBM. I'm recently on the server working team. And um, I happen to be one that was coming to Poland. And so I could help present this because there's been some changes on the group lately. So I might not be the deepest in all the areas, um, but we'll work through that. So we're going to just start with, well, what's been happening since um, the last one. And with Fedora 23, we've been seeing um, some things going in for the server roles. Um, the free IPA, the cockpit, uh, the first release with the media installed. Uh, did we get some of the other ones? No. Nope. Let's go back. So I work for IBM. I'm a secondary arches guy. So a couple of them that I care about that I didn't get on here is that um, we were able to deliver secondary with primary for the first time ever. Thank you, Peter. Um, one of the other things that I care about just from where we're coming over is um, the whole OpenQA effort. So OpenQA is running on the primary arches. Uh, one of the things I want to do is find Adam. Is Adam in the room? By it's, not, it's not here at all. Okay. Because um, I, I really want to get that running on secondary. I want to get that running everywhere because um, I think it's a great thing. Anytime we can get automated testing, we can get scripts going, uh, then we can focus on the harder areas. I think that would be great. So we've gotten some really good things done. Um, but the most of the talk will probably be more about other changes later. So in 24, they changed the uh, default layout. There's no more home partition. They're going to grow the space. Uh, the free IPA, a cockpit update, storage D replacing UDIS, those sorts of things. Oh, and, and here, here's a couple other things we were able to do is we, we were able to add Docker images, we are able to add cloud images, and bit by bit we're adding more to that. Um, I'm hoping as we get these added, my emphasis is actually on power, but I'm always hoping we get things done that, you know, the ARM can use it, the S390 can use it. Once we're adding it for one, let's make sure that it's available for all. So then, this is the part where I'm hoping we, we can get a lot more interaction, get some ideas. Where is the server going? What, what do we want this to do over the next few releases till we meet again? What would be some focus areas? So, uh, Steven was working on roll kit. We can keep that going. We'd need volunteers. Uh, there's talk. We could use uh, OpenShift and get a lot more with containers go that route. Um, and then the, the server edition and modules. So that's starting to lead in to the modularity talk. Um, Langdon is here. This is going to be a plug. Go to his talk, go to his workshop. When we were meeting on IRC, this looked like something that was very positive. A lot of people could see how that would be working. Um, maybe we can get a lot of energy around it. We'd have a base runtime stack to boot the system. We'd have modules. We can install sets of code, update them. Um, and then we have the other down here. So we're going to have a, a working group um, on Friday. Hope many of you can attend. Bring other ideas. Um, it's supposed to be very collaborative. We don't want to just dictate where it goes. I certainly don't know where it's going. So here's a slide, a little bit more about the modularity. And again, um, it, it would be better to go to his talk to get the full thing. The, the idea is, is to allow sets of code to be added in easily, to have 90% of your release be very, very stable. But the part you want cutting edge, the part you want to be updating all the time and using, you have a way to do it. So this kind of outlines some of the major bullet points for how we would do something like this. Um, and 
as you can see, he's at it that they're looking on delivering something maybe by F26, and he'll be able to tell you about that and start um, making the server and the modular working group much tighter. Get there. So going over this, again, the, the questions I had is just how do we install, manage, configure it? What do we want on it? What are the file systems? Do people know how they're being used? Uh, one of the things I'd like to get a better grip on is do people know where Fedora servers are being used out there? Do we have use cases? Do we know what we should be focusing on? Do we have the right file system on there? Do we have the right disk petitioning on there? Is modularity a way we want to go? Um, I think the server working group would love to hear from people about it. Um, there's some open positions on the server working group if you'd want to participate with us that way. It would be awesome. And um, the session is going to be at um, 1.30 in the room just down the hall on Friday. So that would be great. Um, documenting where the roles are again. I, the big thing I see different between like the roll and roll kit and what I've heard about modularity, and maybe we'll see it different, is the install versus install and config. And so how do we get that stuff going? What are we going to do about it? Hi, uh, I'm Stephen Gallagher. I think most of you probably know me. Um, I was formerly on the server working group. I took, uh, I've taken some time off uh, to find myself, but. Um, <laughs> down the bike of the couch? Sorry? You found yourself down the bike of the couch? Yeah, yeah. Um, you don't want to know what's back there. So, when we started on the server working group, um, when we started on the three edition split, uh, each of the editions really was also trying to find itself. We, uh, you know, we built the workstation as not just a fully, you know, a fully featured desktop, but it was specifically going to be a desktop for getting stuff done. Um, with the cloud, with the cloud, we wanted a space where we'd be able to explore some of the really cool new technologies that were coming along, the atomic stuff, the, desk, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Docker stuff, um, even just you know, enhancements in virtualization. With server, we, uh, at first we were a little less certain about exactly where we wanted to go. Um, we, wanted, we knew we, we needed something that was going to be at least closer to Fedora's historical uh, developer base, which was, you know, Fedora, Red Hat, Linux, they, those things were started by, you know, ad admins who wanted to get something done. Uh, those were, and that was our original constituency. And then over time, we kind of moved towards being more of a desktop distribution, and a lot of that traditional audience felt it was feeling sidelined. So we wanted to build the server to be a place for them to feel part of the community again. Um, and also, we wanted to have a place that was more closely attuned to what our major, uh, our major uh, financial contributor <laughs> uh, is, do is doing with Red Hat Enterprise Linux. We wanted to make sure we weren't pit taking Fedora to a place where it wasn't going to be helpful in producing that next level of enterprise distribution. So we, we came up. Oh, we have the, we had the server edition. We, took, we decided that that's where we we're going to go, and then we. We spent quite a few weeks uh, after uh, Flock in uh, Charleston figuring out, so what does that mean? What, what exactly does a, an admin, a, a server administrator, a data center administrator need out of an, a Linux system? And what, and what are we already doing and what aren't we doing well? And one of the things that we identified that we really do, weren't doing well and that nobody was doing well was deploying solutions. We were really, really good at getting packages onto your system. We were really terrible at helping you make them do anything useful. Um, and that's and, and different distributions have had different solutions for that. For example, the uh, the Arch Linux uh, project has absolutely beautiful documentation. Whatever else you want to say about that that project, they have amazing documentation. We didn't. Uh, some of that has been improving over the last few years, and I'm, I actually think that's despite our best efforts. But um, with, uh, the, with the server edition, what we decided was that we wanted to be able to reduce the barrier to entry for a lot of, a lot of people to make it easier to do uh, 
common server tasks with the least amount of effort. So we, we developed this kind of concept of server roles, and we, we built one, uh, you know, an implementation of what we thought that would look like. Now, server role was basically, the, the, the high level concept of it was to be able to point to a server and say, you, you're now a domain controller, and you, you're a database server for a LAMP stack, and you, I don't know what you do. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, but the idea would be that for the most part, you would just be able to say, okay, I want you to be this and more or less out of the box, get something that does this with the least amount of human interaction possible. Uh, that, you know, if we wanted to build a domain controller, we bring up free IPA and its DNS uh, server and we ask you only to provide the admin password. Everything else we'll set up for you at, at, in our best effort, and we can tweak it later if it's not quite to your needs. But out of the box, you should be able to essentially hit a button and get a working system. Uh, so as a, basic, as a prototype and then later close to production project, we built RollKit, uh, which was basically just a, a simple Python wrapper around the installers for a variety of different pro projects that just took, just took it and applied what we consider common sense secure defaults. Uh, and we built it up as an API uh, which had a CLI most, that was originally mostly for testing, but nobody ever consumed the API, so it ended up being the primary <laughs> interaction. And had I known that was going to happen, definitely would have involved a designer in the uh, <laughs> process. But it worked. It, um, it, it, it wasn't all that pretty, and don't look at the code, but it worked. Uh, you know, uh, I know a number of people who had been struggling, for example, uh, I know Andrew, uh, Alexander would back me up on, a lot of people have trouble installing free IPA. It's a complicated piece of software, and there's a lot of stuff, uh, even, even that uh, just needs to be in place before you run the installer, uh, that I think we were able to fix with RollKit. You know, we were able to tweak some of the, uh, you know, the Etsy hosts uh, uh, mess and all that, just to ensure that, yes, you hit this button, and. At the end of it, you are going to get something that works. That I think one one point I okay. would like to make for this is that what we found out in free APA development is that people don't read their documentation, regardless of how hard you work on. It is funny how often that gets rediscovered. Yes. <laughs> uh, for the, sorry, for the sake of the for the sake of the recording, the uh, comment from the audience is: during free free IPA development, it was rediscovered that. No one reads documentation. So we have probably uh, the biggest documentation out of the whole realm set of docs uh, around IPA and the uh, certificates and, and all of this stuff. And people still have trouble setting things up because nobody reads that documentation. Yeah. And it's really good cool. documentation. Yes, yes, it is. And, and I use most of it. And when, the when, other when, part uh, is yeah. people come from uh, a variety of backgrounds, yes. including the backgrounds of migrating from proprietary systems like Microsoft Windows environments and so on. They have even less understanding. They know a lot how to manage systems, but they have less understanding of the technology backgrounds in the Linux environment. I agree. Uh, you know what? Give, what? give me a moment because that was a to be a pro. Oops. You've jumped ahead to my next topic. Okay. <laughs> so um, this was not directly part of the, uh, the server working group discussions, but just prior to its uh, instantiation, I'd had a number of conversations inside of Red Hat where uh, we were doing essentially a, a, what we call a gap analysis, figure, uh, figuring out what, what do our competitors do better than we do. And first and foremost, I said, well, besides everything at that point, this was, this was years ago now, uh, but uh, from a user experience perspective, uh, install, if you installed Microsoft Windows Server and turned it on, the very first thing it did was load a graphical environment and give you a list of things you might want to have this machine do. You would load it with Red Hat Enterprise Linux Server, and the first thing you did when you go when you powered it on was get a, was, was get a black and white screen with a with a, a login prompt, and not, and then once you got your login prompt, it, once you entered your login. You got a black and white screen with a, you know, a dollar sign next to it, and no clear indication of where to go next. So that was part of the uh, the reason why we, when we formed the server working group, we pretty much all agreed 
right out of the gate that we wanted to meet that gap. We wanted to find a place where we could build a system that a person could uh, would get useful information right from the get-go and be able to do something uh, useful to it. And, that, and we looked at it around and we saw that, it, that the cockpit project was getting a lot closer to that. Um, and so what we decided uh, pretty much you know, uh, you know, unanimously was, okay, we're going to make the cockpit project the official GUI for the Fedora server. And then what we would try to do is build our capabilities, these roles, uh, in such a way that they would be deployable by cockpit. And we can have cockpit solve that same first install problem uh, where nowadays if you start up a Fedora server, uh, at that login prompt, you also get a notice for the graphical installer, connect to this address, uh, this IP address, colon this uh, this port, and you will get cockpit, and you can do a great deal of stuff in a discoverable way. And people absolutely love this, and I, I remember hearing an awful lot of people saying, "How soon can we have that in RHEL?" <laughs> um, and I think I think as of seven three they can now, but uh, it took a while. Seven three something. Thank you. No, it won't be it. No. Maybe I'm thinking of 7.2 then. So, uh, I so got confused. 7.2. I think two. it was, yeah, 7.2. So. Yeah, I, 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 knew, I was pretty sure it was at least that was out, yeah. just so I got the number wrong. My apologies, but Sorry. thank you for correcting me. Um, so, uh, you know, and then we were going to try, try and take this roles concept and make it so that it could be deployed by cockpit. And that, unfortunately, never really materialized. And then, as time, uh, time passed, uh, that project didn't get the it didn't get the uh, the collaboration we we needed. It didn't hit critical mass, and the two people that were working on it both got pulled onto other uh, projects. So it's now kind of in life support. I'm personally basically maintaining it. So if anybody discovers a serious bug, I'll patch it. But it, uh, otherwise, it's not going to see any more active development right now unless we decide to reinvest in it. So one of the things that came up in a recent server working group meeting was, okay, the concept is sound. We still certainly want to have the ability to apply useful services to a machine and have them work. So what is the mechanism that we're going to use to do that? Uh, one, one that came up was Ansible. Another that came up was uh, build, OpenShift, uh, build OpenShift or Nullicule applications. Um, look at Puppet uh, for, for things that might integrate with satellite. Also, uh, you know, vague ideas. We want to hear uh, what makes sense, what can we do there, and what will work with uh, Cockpit. So that's one of the things we were hoping to have as part, as part of this conversation, uh, and this should be a conversation. Is, uh, how, do we, how do we solve these problems? How do, uh, what is the best approach going forward? Maybe it's staying with Rollkit, and everyone in this room is suddenly going to decide, I'm going to pick it up and help contribute right now. Show of hands. <laughs> Well, I got one, <laughs> but uh, realistically, uh, it, was, it was a good try. Uh, we can do better. Let's learn from our mistakes and figure out what's the next step. So, uh, do you want to? Well, no, I mean, I, I like everything you say, being a little newer to all of this, um, getting back to your point, I, I personally work better off of examples. So if there's anything ever that can come up, start configuring it, I can see it work, and then I go through and start learning about it, tweak setting by setting. I mean, that always appeals to me. So um, we'll have to work through that. Because the other downside is we give you defaults if they're crappy defaults, right? Now you're not going to be happy or you get bid. But sure. Just one example, another example from my behavior. At least you get on the recording. Yeah. So for those who don't know me, and that's probably the majority here, <laughs> um, my name is Alexander Bakavoy. I'm working on FreeAB and Samba and SSSD and all this identity mess that we created over 30, 40 years. And uh, so one thing I wanted to talk about is in IPA, we encountered a problem that it's fine, you set up a role as the main controller. You have this shiny Fedora server that runs and works. It's fine, and then you have machines that needs to connect to this domain controller, and those are AIX, HPUX, and Solaris, and old 
rail machines and all Fedora machines. So you have to kind of backport the knowledge that you have incorporated within this shiny Fedora to those old environments. And it's not just a code. Sometimes it's a change in what software you actually use there or totally different things. So what we came in with the um, idea that you can generate on the server because server knows its own state uh, a sort of uh, advice how to configure those all the clients. And we created a system that's called IP Advice that right now is fairly limited in the sense that it only allows you to generate advices how to configure these old clients against itself. But the advice is effectively what you ask it for is the example how to take the settings that are in the server and apply them to other machines, whether they are servers or clients or whatever, um, taking that knowledge um, in the advice with the setting. This might be a template. It might be something more smart than just a template uh, for the configuration. I can see it being very interesting to uh, build that into a, an SCAP implementation, such that exactly. you, such exactly. you just generate apply. an SCAP to apply to exactly. AIX, which has its own SCAP implementation. Yes. So, so just with, happens. with uh, AIX, it might be actually uh, applying the knowledge that you, as a developer on IPA side, has about how AIX configuration should look like, which does not mean that admin managing that AIX necessarily has this idea how securely it should be configured or might have some problems in actually configuring it. So this would be probably an interesting topic for the server group because it's not a role applying on the, on the server itself. It's the role that the server wants to put on the clients connected to the server. And it might not be just an IPA kind of thing, but in IPA we have this uh, good position that we know much about the uh, how your infrastructural heart is actually configured, for example. How it's pumping the blood of, of your enterprise, these identities and, and all these details. And that we can actually take it and apply it in some other place. It's a small idea, but again, this idea actually proved to be very helpful for the actual uh, administrators for the point. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think I, I saw you were taking notes, which is great. Uh, well, yeah, that should probably come up in the next week's Fedora <coughs> server. So uh, we planned on this being uh, about half of the uh, session being uh, a catch up of where we are, and then hopefully the Q and A section basically being. Throw some ideas at us and let's see what uh, let's see what you guys have because, uh, like I was saying to somebody before, the basic concept of meritocracy is the best idea wins. However, the the implicit requirement of that is that all the ideas are presented. So, please help us figure out uh, how do we how do we reach these goals? Uh, I have a question. Why do you have uh, so much diversity? Because you decide that uh, that. Uh, So, uh, actually, at present, we don't actually offer a server cloud image, oh, yeah. uh, but uh, that's, it's been talked about that uh, we may actually swap the, swap out the uh, the current base image uh, with the server image, and then just have server and atomic, which do serve different needs. Uh, though, there's also talk about making this uh, about having the server image also be run, uh, project also be OS tree based. So, short answer is. We don't really know what uh, what the right uh, need is there. I mean, the 
the cloud image as it stands right now is basically trying to solve uh, a problem that we decided we weren't going to try to solve in the server, which was, I want the absolute minimum possible stuff on my, uh, my system, uh, and I'll build the rest from there. That, when we put together the server, uh, the server PRD, uh, we agreed that was a non-goal for the server edition. Our server edition was, to, was meant to provide a known platform, not a, uh, you know, not, not that green sheet of the Lego, you know, that you get in the Legos that you build on, every, you know, build the house on top of. Uh, we wanted to, we wanted to, well, to, to use one of Matthew's uh, excellent um, metaphors with, with Legos, we wanted to build, build them, give them uh, a kit, not, uh, not just a bucket of Lego bricks. A kit with instructions. Yes, a kit, a, a kit and the instructions, no, you know, the, the, not, not like you got to get at the uh, yard sale or just get the block of the bricks. Um, so it was a specific goal of Fedora server that you would get more than just the minimum set. It's not, it's not, it, we, we knew that we were going to alienate a certain subset of the population, but we were also hoping that by providing something that, we, that works out of the box as opposed to you build it into something that's functional would be uh, something that would be more likely to gather new contributors, new users, um, if they can just do something right from the get-go. When they get more uh, more experience, there's absolutely nothing stopping them from tinkering. The, the Fedora project always allows you to use the net install and do that building from blocks. So our specific goal was give them something that is a complete system. You know, similar to the way Microsoft does it, Microsoft. Uh, Microsoft gives you a complete operating system and a, and a large number of APIs. Actually, it's actually not really true. Because if you look at the um, server versions that you can get from Microsoft, you actually have a dose of those. It's not just the same. Yeah, so like yes. Microsoft will give you a minim, essentially a minimal or a standardized install right. and then a UX, which enables you to configure a domain control. Right, and that's right, and that's exactly what well, we, that was exactly the model we were trying yeah. to match was that the, you know everything using is there, and then you can configure it based using in yeah. this case Rollkit to get a domain control right. or a DB server or something. Right, like using just you know at core, which is you know the, the, the cloud base image is very is basically at core and cloud and cloud in it. Um, that's a very different case from I'm going to provide you the platform necessary to apply anything else on top of it. And that was what we were trying to go for with uh, server. And it, ultimately, it wasn't a whole lot more than, well, you get the minimum, you get firewall D, you get system D, you get, uh, you get roll kit, um, and you get cockpit. You know, and that, those were really the only things atop the minimum image, but they were things we wanted to be able to say, you are guaranteed to have these, and you can rely on this as API. Why, why would It might be. Uh, and then Ansible's got like all these thousands of playbooks. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it well, up, the major the major reason why it, it, it's uh, not top of the list is because it's lacking Python three support. And right now, we've actually managed to get to the server. I think in twenty five, they finally got Python three out of uh, Samba. So I think we're no. not not quite. I know no. that was out of I know they got it out of PyLDB and PyTDB. Mm -hmm. We still we still need. Okay. We're close though, and we, we've been we've been driving very hard towards getting Python two out of the basic, uh, out of the standard install. And actually, it's, it's still not in the standard install because uh, we don't include Samba out of the box. Yeah. Uh, we have a, we have an easy way to get it, but uh, I don't believe we. I think we have. Well, actually, we, we might have some uh, the Samba client because it because it's I think it's pulled in by the default instead of. Uh, so there's a bunch right. of that, that's, that's, stuff that's, that's pulled in by Triple SD. Yeah, I was just going to say it might, it might it might be pulled in by SSSD, but it doesn't have to be. We could actually exclude that part, but. Uh, well, it's not not currently you can't. Uh, the packaging allows it, and we just are already pulling in the ACPD kit components, but we could just switch to having Relty pull those in when it needs it instead. So we could get it off. We could theoretically get Python 3 out of the middle. Also, answering right the then question, why not Ansible? Yeah. By the time when all this rule oh, was no, presented, it wasn't, it, it wasn't even in scope of getting in. So, but going forward, one of the things like, right, and, and maybe like we got peanut yeah. butter and jelly here. Yeah, right. Well, one of the things we're probably retiring is going back to the 
Ansible is awesome and it has all these default things, but you still end up at a text login prompt and have to manually run it. Now right, that, right, that, right, you added, yes, so that changes. Right? I said so that changes when Tower gets open source, and we can ship Tower as that by default. Also, it also changes can get, if we can put it if we can put a playbook implementation into Kotlin. Yeah. 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 For limited uses. Yeah. For targeted uses. The, the other part of it is uh, it assumes that we are talking about orchestration for more than one machine. Right now, the server is about single machine. Well, uh, mostly, yeah. The, 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 so the targeted group was small, medium businesses. Exactly, yeah. but to get, to, get, to get from a single machine to orchestration, you need to know about the infrastructure. So somebody needs to input more details than just a single machine. And that so means... Does the have simple playbooks? Like, I get one on the web server? It does, yes. Yeah, and right. well, well, I I use how you would deploy particular machines highly dependent on your particular environment. Some of them might be a, a real hardware. Some of them might be VMs. Yeah, be deployed but there. that's, so not, it's, that's it's, not the use case we're talking about here. We're talking about taking a single server and having <coughs> a, the ability to say, give me a lamp stack on that single server, at which point the Ansible playbooks will do that very, very convincingly very, very easily yes. as a, a single server, a single device. Sure, you can use Ansible to manage entire sets of infrastructure, but you can also use it to configure a single box out of the box with that being straightforward playbooks. That being said, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm not sure Ansible uh, could install free IPA at the present. Because we, I don't, because we last I checked, playbooks are themselves, but not in the, uh, the central. Okay. Well, because I mean, last, last I checked, IPA server installed wasn't uh, uh, in the no. Yes, which no. would make it very difficult to use for that purpose. So, just a quick recap. It sounds like there's a lot of people interested in Ansible, and there are historic reasons why it wasn't a folks at the server working group. But as we're talking about what the group's going to do for the next year, it sounded like the only issue was Python 2 versus Python 3. That was, right. the, that was the major reason why it hadn't been bumped up to the front of the list, but it was certainly still in contention. And if Python 2 is still stuck there for other reasons, maybe it's not a blocker. Are there other, other technical limitations? Uh, well, no. The other, the, other, uh, the other items on the list were other things that people were interested in working on. Okay. So uh, the other one that uh, Mike uh, mentioned was that we talked about uh, possibly switching roles over to be uh, Nullicule slash OpenShift, uh, OpenShift uh, applications to tie, to tie better into the efforts we had that are being done by Project Atomic. Um, and I know uh, pro and Project, uh, and I don't know if anyone here, everyone here has heard of Project FAO yet. Uh, the uh, Fedora, uh, Fedora Atomic Origin, uh, which oh. is, I'm sorry? Yeah, I haven't heard of that before. Yeah. Um, <laughs> th 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 that's the current uh, working title. I thought it was going to be you dancing on a piano. I don't have a piano. Like FAO I, Yeah, I got it. Um, I, I was just not dignifying it. Um, so you know, with the with, with another large uh, set of the subset of the project working towards that, we thought maybe that was something we'd approach as as an option. Also, is use uh, a Kubernetes based uh, based uh, deployment system that could theoretically, you know, if we designed it right, be migrated into a Project Atomic world down the road. When you when you're when you you know when you grow past one or two servers and you want to start orchestrating and make it trivial to migrate into a cloud, into a, uh, an atomic environment as opposed to uh, a, what, what are we calling it, mode one environment? Um, a traditional. A traditional environment. So uh, that was, that was at the moment, that was high at the top yeah, on the list. Or, and a four and a mode one or mode two. Expensive for Classic. Uh, Whatever. Anyway, legacy. I don't care. The terms, uh, the terms are meaningless if we don't have an agreement on the definitions. So, uh, anyway, but anyway, uh, at the time when we were discussing this, there were more people around who were talking, who were interested in talking about atomic and, uh, and containers as a, as a potential solution. So that kind of got bumped up to the forefront. There were, you know, nobody was actively advocating for Ansible at the time. So, it, it, you know, it, as, as Brendan is fond of saying, he who writes the patch wins the argument. 
uh, the people who were present were talking about this other thing, so that was the one that, that was gaining steam. So if people, if people here want to start contributing playbooks, uh, that then maybe we write a, we start working on writing a, you know, a Dbus wrapper so that Cochrane can talk to them. Because I don't think Ansible has a, it has a, it has any kind of a public API presence of it. Well, or is it that, just the CLI? I it's been a while since I've looked at it, but I think basically that's what Tower provides. One of the things that Tower provides. Okay. And I'm not the, sure we want to wait for Tower though. So. Well, in the pre Red Hat world, that was their way of generating revenue. And if you want to integrate with this, you integrate with it through Tower because it has right. the API and the GUI and all that. I, um, the last I heard on the open sourcing of Tower was at Ansible Fest in London in February, and they said it will happen at some point. Right. Um, but I don't know what that. I think. Is. Yeah, I think maybe in the meantime, it's not the worst idea ever for us to write a wrapped uh, API and then. Maybe there, there probably already is out there for something along those lines, yeah. and and certainly there's a lot of work to be done to sort of put together a well uh, orchestrated set of playbooks that are not really good, yeah. um, which would be then consumable whether it's Tower or some other interface. So, a show of hands, who would want to contribute to that project if we kicked it off? All right, so I got one and a, I, I got two and a half. That's that's better. That's better. And if it was the origin, and if it was origin-based uh, Kubernetes orchestrated kind of containers, show of hands. Very different audience from the last time. <laughs> so okay, so yeah, I think uh, we take that certainly back and uh, let's talk about that more at the uh, powwow. Yep. Certainly. I know yeah, a pitch that is very similar to yours. Of, um, I, I think servers should be also shipping a bigger image. And I'm very surprised every time I go there to try to use it and it's not there and I have to get one from the cloud. Yeah, um, I, I, I was annoyed by that too. Uh, and I started trying to put one together to for Rollkit development because it was really kind of inconvenient to the, the script I had to write to uh, turn cloud into There's a nice little ARM server image though. There's a what? That's a little ARM server image. In Vagrant? No, it doesn't have Vagrant support, but... That's not helping him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. It, uh, has to be, it has to be simple for the likes of me to be able to launch. It, it, I think I can agree with that, though. I think that we could uh, probably take that, that to a working group that a Vagrant image should be a blocking that server image. Okay. Um, uh, maybe scrap something else to figure out. a Vagrant server <laughs> image um, and enable it in the build. Yeah. I will. Matt's argument for I mean, we should, any addition we ship, any anything we ship, we should, we should bring a bigger version of something. By default. Yeah, that seems fair. Uh, so Langdon has volunteered to work on the bigger image. Alright, good one. <laughs> See, you've got the experience. If I had a round to a public volunteer. <laughs> Sorry? If I had a round to a public volunteer to assist with that. Sure. Does the scenario of multiple roles for one server support it? Uh, it? It is supported by the, the, the technology as it exists today. Uh, it was it was our official ruling was that it was never required to be tested together, uh, and that we were uh, the way that we were actually ended up implementing it was that we built the possibility of roles allow, uh, being able to explicitly conflict with other roles. So if we knew that they weren't going to work on the same machine, they wouldn't be allowed. To, uh, you would be allowed to install them on the same machine. Um, you know, we, uh, if you have two different uh, two different implementations of, uh, say, my, you wouldn't be able to want to install MySQL and my, MariaDB on the same machine. They would be accepted. But tech, uh, we, we, and, and we only promised uh, to QA because we didn't want an uh, infinite number of uh, combinatorial uh, tests. We promised them that they only ever had to test one one role on the server. But the, the technology permits it, it's just... So that's one of those I clicked around the copy that I saw the options, and there was an option, I think, apply a role to the server, install the role, and copy it. There isn't, yeah. Uh, we, keep, we keep trying, and, we keep, and, and it keeps not being a uh, high enough priority for, <coughs> for them to actually manage to get it into a sprint. Uh, but at this point, at this point, I, I've told them not to. I, I've told them to just take it off of the uh, to-do list until we figure out what what is going to replace Rollkit, because 
it's become pretty clear that Volkit was not the right, it was not the right hammer for that screw. Sure. Uh, you could you could do that on normal. You could you, we had uh, we had roll uh, roll control uh, deploy and we had roll roll control decommission. Uh, and for the three rolls that we ever actually managed to release, all three of them actually did a complete clean up too. So it, it, you actually did get back to basically the exact same system you had before, which was um, which was actually not an explicit goal, but managed to work out. Anyway. So, uh, I have a question for the audience. Is anyone in here a, a, a assistant admin in their in their day job? All right. Thank you, Kevin. <laughs> um, what? Well, actually, let me, let me ask you a second question first. Are any of you using Fedora Server in your in your production environment? Okay. Those of you who had, who had your hand raised in the first question and not in the second question, what would it take? Saying support. Yeah, that's not nice. support. It's a poli more a political thing. Yeah, exactly. Well, uh, well, let, well, let me ask that question though. Uh, because you answered what you answered with was not uh, you answered with a, with a specific implementation of the solution. Not a description of the problem it solves. What about paid support? Is uh, what does that imply? Uh, what is the problem that solves? SLI for fixing bugs, or responding to. Okay, and SLI for fixing bugs, that's interesting. Uh, I think it's more than that. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, we work on that, right? Yeah. I work on bank too, and there is a regulatory body in Poland. Uh, Regulates the banking industry, and one of the requirements is to have a support contract for their systems. Okay, and that's a requirement of actually all banks across right. Europe. Okay, and I, I, I can sort of I can understand that. So maybe you were, you two were not specifically the right audience, but <laughs> <laughs> let, let, let's assume hypothetically that sorry. that break it. Sorry. If if I could stay, I started out with Fedora servers. I, I'm a system administrator for a school. We started out with Fedora only on our servers, and maybe about five years ago, we migrated most of them over to CentOS. Over the last few years, I have started deploying a few Fedora servers, mainly for IPA. It's beautiful. For what? Thank Sorry. you. Uh, IPA. Oh, okay. The, the documentation, I at least read, read the documentation, <laughs> mainly because I got myself in a hole, and it was beautiful. Okay, so I do appreciate it. Somebody appreciates it. But one of the things that I know we, one of the main reasons we switched from Fedora to CentOS was, was the update cycle, upgrade cycle was just insane. As, well, when you say no, I'm talking Fedora oh, Core Five. Right. Well, no, I, I want to know what yeah. uh, what uh, upgrade cycle is insane means. Okay, you. sorry. What it meant to me was I had I had the was it because the up, was it because after the upgrades things were broken. Or After the because, upgrades, things were broken. Now, again, okay. we're talking ancient history, but yeah. Right. Well, because again, I like to try to hear what the actual problem yeah, is, the not problem the is. not the symptom of the problem. No, that's totally right. I would do upgrades, and we would have things not working, and it would take a number of hours, maybe a few days, for me to track down what was going on and get it sorted out, which is not the greatest thing when you're working with production servers. Sure. So we switched to CentOS again. Uh, since switching to IPA and um, and running Fedora on, uh, on the service that we have IPA on, they have run really, really well. I've gone from, I don't know, 21 up to 23 on one school's system. So I just, uh, a couple of weeks ago, set up a brand new IPA server on Fedora 24 for a totally different school that I help out, and, and it worked beautifully. So. I've been really happy with Fedora over the last couple of releases. That's always good. Um, the one problem I did run into more recently was with Overt. I was running Overt on Fedora, and then there came a point where I think it was basically 
not really supported. Like yeah. they strongly recommended switching to. I think they're different. still. I think they're still recommending to install it on through our site. There's a bug in it that was reviewed by another big kernel that we updated to, and it felt like the kernel was moving too fast. But we continued supporting it. Right. Well, and and then there was a bunch of stuff that from the host side of over the break in F24 and they didn't fix it in time and it was retired and now they've come to go and they've had a big cry about it. Um, and it's like, well, you were emailed like 30 times about fixing this and you get an email every day in your broken depth report and you pay no attention to it. So. I think it's no question of the policies of particular or responsibilities of a particular upstream to what they provide, regardless of which source uh, you get access to that software, you will have problems if the upstream is not really responsible for what they deliver. Yeah, or interested in assisting. Yes. Yes. Well, so and I think I think one of the things that we we as Fedora as a whole, not just server, have gotten a lot better at them since Fedora Core Five is uh, we have, we still move fast and break things. But we usually tell you when the break is coming. <laughs> uh, we, we've gotten a lot better at, at uh, letting people know, you know, the, the following things uh, that you may be, may be relying on are going to change the ABI in the next release, and here's how, here's what is changing. So that has helped a lot. But people don't read documentation. <laughs> ah, thank you, Brandon. Sorry. Maybe release notes. Right. Well, yeah. Sometimes they read, read release notes, and that's where we try to stick with some of this stuff. Um, I don't mean since the people, I, I, well, I just want to finish showing you this, I thought I was having before, before I lose it, um, about the upgrades. <coughs> One of the things that people kept coming to us uh, when we first started the server and saying is, well, what we really need from you is long, you know, it's a long-term life cycle. And when asked, uh, when, when dug down, nine times out of 10, and I've got one minute left, I'm sorry. Uh, when, nine times out of 10, what they really meant was, uh, we want to know when we upgrade to the we, we, we want to know that things aren't just going to keep breaking out from under us. And so what we said was that, well, the longer life cycle isn't necessarily the only solution to that. The better solution to that is we build up our upgrade testing and make sure that upgrades are clean. Yeah. So that when you when you upgrade, it should be more like, when you upgrade Fedora, we want it to be more like going from RHEL 6.2 to 6.3 than from going from RHEL 6 to RHEL 7. And I mean, interestingly, in the RHEL 7 stuff, the from 7.0 to 7.1 to 7.2 is probably about the equivalent of going from Fedora 21 to Fedora yeah. 22 to Fedora 23 server editions because there is a lot more movement in or the rail side of things and moving a lot faster. Yeah. Okay, I believe that my time is now up. I'm not sure who was supposed to be telling me that, but my watch is doing it. So. Uh, thank you very much for coming uh, and to those of you who participated as well. Uh, I appreciate it. I'm sure my